So here we go, halfway through this shorter unit, unit six, uh, we have wrapped up the uh, first part of it, which was learning, I had to remember uh, what the first part of it was. It was learning, it was classical conditioning, offering conditioning, social learning, everything else. Now we're gonna get into problem solving. And this sort of gets into how we think, things that impact how we think. Because again, you could have two people, when you got some people that think liberally and some people that think conservatively, some people that are more likely to be Republicans, Democrats, fascists, communists, whatever, you know, we see the exact same stimuli, yet we process and we think about it differently. So this is about what makes us think the way that we do. Now, we took a little bit of that in with social psychology, but this is really going to get into the human mind and how we think. And if nothing else, it's not necessarily for you to, I mean, you can self-reflect for this a little bit, but it's also to gain an understanding of why other people think the way they do. A lot of times when people think a certain way, we just go, well, they're stupid, they're ignorant, they're but 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 there's a reason, there's something that got them there. There's something that got them there. And somebody who's racist wasn't just born a racist. You know, they had to learn it, which we talked a little bit about with social psychology. And when all you hear is a truth, that's all it's going to be. For example, if I was teaching my daughter colors, and I might have used this example before, and if I have, I apologize. I, let's say my daughter's going into kindergarten. For kindergarten, we're going over the colors. Like, you see this, honey? You see that? You know what color that is? She goes, no. I go, that's blue. You say blue? She says blue. I go, you see what color this is right here? That's pink. Can you say pink? And she says, she says pink. I go, you see this color right here? This is green. Can you say green? And she says green. And then I go, do you see this color right here? You know what that is? that's purple. Can you say purple? And she says purple, and that becomes her reality. So then when she gets to school and they go over the colors, everybody, what color is this? Blue, what color is this? Pink, what color is this? Green, what color is this? And my daughter says purple, and all the kids laugh at her, and the teacher laughs at her. How dare you? What's wrong with you? No, honey, that's orange. Well, now, who's my daughter going to believe? Teacher? Her daddy. She's going to believe daddy. As a matter of fact, the teacher's now lost all credibility. Hell, this teacher doesn't even know what color purple is. So there's a reason we think the way we do. And again, to my daughter at the age of five, that is totally logical. And then there's the, the inner her that when you go, no, 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 it's not purple, that's orange. And she's going to go, no. It's what I know to be true. And you can't, it's hard for us to admit we're wrong. Again, I'm 53 years old. If I change my religion today, that means I was wrong for 53 years. No matter what I followed, if I followed anything, I have to admit I was wrong. And a lot of our egos won't allow us to do that. So that's what we're going to take a look at. We're going to take a look at how we think. So this is cognition. And again, cognition is thinking. We've said it a thousand times. Let's say it again. Cognition is any mental activity associated with processing, understanding, communicating, getting information to others, knowing, remembering, all these things as part of our cognition. And as advanced as the human mind is, we can be spectacularly bad at thinking because so many things get in the way. What's true? What we want to believe to be true. It's the reason right now, as I'm doing this in August of 2021, as we're getting ready to start school, there's such a divide on vaccinations. You know, there's science. And when it comes to science and things like math, two plus three should be five. Yet you've got arguing of, no, it's not five. Well, my science says, and that's a very interesting, my science, you know, it, it's a very interesting thing that's sort of going on. Computers are very logical. You program them, they do math, logic. Humans not all the time, or not always logical. So again, when we study cognition, we want to study logical thinking, but we also want to understand the illogical thinking. Let's study the rational, but the rational is easy to understand. It's rational. It's the irrational thinking. You know, the why did I do that? I mean, how many times have you gotten to the end of the day? Why did I do that? Why did I say that? What did I, you know, that's what we want to study. Very smart people can be victims of scams. Very smart people can go down the rabbit hole of a conspiracy theories and even join cults, which is basically something based on a conspiracy theory. You know, you have genius people 
that were part of the Heaven's Gate cult back in the 80s or 90s, who kind of as a group committed suicide because they felt the spaceship was going to pass at a certain time and their spirits would be lifted. That's who we want to study. That's who we want to understand. I want to understand the flat earthers, you know, and, and I know that the earth is round. It's as round as this ball. But why do the flat earthers believe that it's flat? Is it really that they believe that it's flat or is it, I want to be part of that group and everything else. They want to believe their science. You know, we're not moving at 100,000 miles per hour. You know, I'd be dizzy. I'd be shaking, you know. Well, we are moving at a, a quite a, a rate of speed. And people will go, well, if we're going so fast, if I take this ball and I throw it up in the air, why does it come right down to me? Huh? Thought the earth was spinning. Why does it come right? Should I go, you know, if I'm spinning, right? No, that's not the way gravity and inertia work. In the same way, if I'm driving in a car 80 miles per hour and I throw the ball up in the air, it's not going to smash through the windshield. But they don't want to hear that because it doesn't go with their narrative. So again, we want to look at logical thinking. We want to look at illogical thinking because they're both fascinating. Okay, they're really fascinating. Anyway, and again, what's really important here is not to get judgmental because a lot of times people want to get into their thoughts and go, well, why are they wrong? It's not why are they wrong? It's why do they think that way? Because there is a possibility I could be wrong. I've never been up in a spaceship. I've never seen the curvature of the earth. Maybe it is. Maybe we never got on the moon. Okay, so it's not that I want to prove somebody else wrong. I just want to understand why they think the way they do and why do I think the way I do. So metacognition is cognition about cognition, thinking about thinking, knowing about knowing, becoming aware of how we become aware and knowing how our mind works and how other minds work. And again, it takes great humility to do this, that you could be wrong, believe why somebody else believes what they do. So cognitive psychology is a study of all of these mental activities. How do we form concepts? How do we solve problems? How do we make decisions, judgment formation? You know, if I'm adding two numbers up, if I'm adding 132 plus 476, you know, I do it in a traditional way. You guys kind of have a new math that works, uh, which I don't, it, logically it doesn't make sense to me, but it's all you've ever known. You've been taught this new way of adding the, the process of it even though it still comes up to the same answer. So when we're doing this studying about thinking, we have to come up with a concept. And a concept is where we mentally group things that are similar with one another. If somebody mentions, hey, here's my address, we all have a concept of what an address is. You know, it's a number on a house, on a business, whatever, it's on a street. The odd numbers are on the uh, east side of the road. The even numbers are on the west, or the odd numbers are on the south side of the road. The even numbers are on the north. Uh, I never known that, but that's the way that it's set up. So we all have a concept that there's numbers, there's streets, there's a zip code that goes with it. And, and, and it's similar for everyone or else the mail couldn't be delivered. If somebody says I'm sitting on a chair, we all have a general concept of what a chair is, even though a chair could be many things. You know, a bar stool could be a chair, a box could be a chair, a sofa could be a chair. There's a lot of different things that could be a chair. If somebody says someone threw a ball, there's a lot of things that could be a ball. There could be this little basketball that's not even quite the size of a basketball. This could be a ball. There could be this little earth right here, which by the way, is round. This could work out as a ball. There's a lot of different concepts of what a ball could be. I don't see any others sitting around in my office here. All right. So when someone says they throw a ball, some of our immediate concepts might be a football. It might be a baseball, you know, not necessarily this little Nerf ball here, which my dog took a bite out of. Uh, so again, we need these concepts because these concepts are important for communication because when somebody says I walked my dog in the park, you have a concept of what walking is. You have a concept of what a dog is. And you have a concept of what a park is. And, you know, you would believe it's on a leash and everything else. And you got little baggies to pick up the poop. All right. Now, a prototype is a typical thing. OK, it's a mental image. If somebody mentioned a dog in your mind, you have what a prototypical dog is. All right. If somebody says the bird was in my yard, we all would probably imagine a bird like this. What we probably wouldn't imagine is a penguin in someone's backyard. First off, a penguin is not a prototypical bird in this area. Secondly, a penguin doesn't fly. You know, so it doesn't it's not even though it is a bird, it's not a prototypical bird. If somebody said an animal or a mammal specifically, you know, we're more likely to think of a lion or an elephant than a whale or a dolphin, even though they are both 
mammals, they're not a prototypical mammal. And so if it doesn't match our prototype, sometimes it, it's a little bit harder to sort of, it's like, oh yeah, I guess it is. You know, it's a little bit harder to do it. And this is why sometimes we don't recognize things like when a guy is a victim of, of a sexual assault or even just sexual harassment. You know, if, if, if some girl looked at a guy and said, hey, big boy, come here, you know, that can make a guy feel uneasy. But we, we don't think of that. I mean, we think of a guy going, oh, that's amazing. She likes me, you know, because we can't get communication. So since it's not typically, it's not the prototypical sexual harassment, isn't the guy as the victim and the woman as the assailant, even though it can happen, it's sometimes harder for us to match up and this can affect court cases and a lot of other things. So concepts and prototypes are great for speeding up thinking. Does it hinder thinking because it encourages categorization and convenient definitions? Of course it does. Does it, does it, does it encourage uh, biased beliefs, racist beliefs? Of course it does. It makes us more susceptible to thinking with bias and prejudice because we want these nice, quick, convenient definitions that have always worked in the past. All right. Now, a couple of types of thinkings we thinkings thinking that we do is convergent and divergent thinking. Convergent thinking is pretty much the way we do everything uh, in school. We look for one possible already established. What, what is the key to the test? One of these four or five answers is the best answer for the test. It's used. We're using facts. We're using logic most often. This is done in multiple choice testing. We are looking for one specific answer to plus six is eight. That's the answer that I'm looking for. Now, divergent thinking is creative thinking. There's many possible solutions. There's not really a key. We're looking for the unexpected, the unusual, spontaneous, free-flowing, artistic, looking for something to be tried in a way it's never been tried before. And this is going to lead to more <laughs> failure, more possibilities of failure. And you got to be okay with failure. You got to be okay with your dog barking uh, because a mailman showing up. So when we solve problems, there's a couple of different ways that we could solve them. One way is what is called an algorithm. And an algorithm is coming up with every particular possible way to solve a problem. And most of our answers are going to be wrong. This is what a computer does. Okay. For example, Take these letters right here, and what do you come up with? Most of you would look at that, and you go, well, I'm in a psychology class, and it's got a PNS and a Y, and it's probably psychology. You didn't use an algorithm. An algorithm is a computer taking this and basically swapping every letter. Okay, this isn't a word, so let me switch the S and the P. It doesn't work. The S and the L doesn't work. The S and the O doesn't work. The S and the Y it doesn't work. The S and the other O doesn't work. And it will go through all 907,000 combinations to come up with the word psychology. And the other trick with it, if it does come up with the word psychology on, on combination 458,342, it'll go to the next one. And yeah, that is psychology, but is that the, it is an answer, but is it the best answer? It's gotta go through all possible combinations in order to ensure that it gets the best answer. So the advantage of an algorithm, you're guaranteed to find the best possible solution. Disadvantage takes forever takes forever. And plus, once you got an answer, why would you continue looking for things? You know, if I'm looking for my keys and I find my keys, I'm not going to continue to look for my keys. I found my keys. These are my keys. You know, that's always why. Where'd you find your keys? The last place I looked. Of course, I'm the last place you looked. And once you find them, you're not going to continue looking for them. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, but I could have possibly left them. But you didn't. They're in your hands. So again, algorithm seems illogical because once you have a great solution, why would you go on? But sometimes a great solution isn't the best solution. You're dating someone, they're pretty good, but does that get in the way of you dating someone who's amazing? All right. So again, there's something to be said for that. Uh, a heuristic, on the other hand, is how we solve most problems. A heuristic is a rule of thumb strategy, allows us to make judgments, usually speedier than an algorithm. For example, if you were out of cereal, and you wanted cereal for breakfast. You want some cereal for breakfast, but you're out of cereal. What do you do? Most of you would say you go to the store and you get some cereal. Okay, it's true. Which store are you going to? You might say H-E-B, really. And then when you walk into H-E-B, what are you gonna do? You probably say, go to the cereal aisle. Cool, you go to the cereal aisle, what are you gonna do? Grab a box of cereal, then what? Gonna go pay for it. Then what? Gonna take it home, gonna eat my cereal. That is a very good solution. That is a very effective solution. And that is a solution that has worked for you at all times. But is it the best solution? 
is it possible? Is it possible that you could have just gone to your neighbor's house and asked them to borrow some cereal and they would have given you some, saved you the trip, saved you some money? Sure. Is it possible that it, you could have gone to Kroger and gotten the cereal a little bit cheaper? It's possible. Did you try every store? No. You went to the cereal aisle. Is it possible that maybe there was a cereal display and maybe that cereal display would have had it cheaper? Sure. Is it possible, had you gone to some place that's not a grocery store, like a big lots, that they could have had some discontinued cereal? Yes. Okay, so there's all these other possibilities. But is it worth traveling around the, the entire city for a box of cereal? No. I'm not going to try, like an algorithm, every possible solution. I'm not going to walk into AutoZone and say, do you have any cereal here? You know, so I'm going to limit myself to what's worked in the past. So the advantage of a heuristic is it's very fast. The disadvantage is it's more error prone than algorithms. Sometimes we're unaware we're using heuristics. You know, sometimes it, it, it gives us something that's always worked, but what's always worked may not be healthy. It's a reason that we sometimes we go back into bad relationships because I'm used to that relationship. It's worked before I have a date for prom now. You know, so sometimes it can get in the way of better solving. Now, once we come up with the solution, we suddenly have insight. And insight is suddenly how something works. You know, when somebody tells you a riddle and you can't come up with a solution and you try and you go all over your brain, and you're searching for it and you just can't find it. For example, if I were to ask you how to make, uh, how do you make seven without doing any sort of mathematical formula? How do you make seven even? And you might think, oh, I don't have to do any math. How do I make seven even? But I can't do any math. So I can't add, I can't subtract, I can't multiply, I can't divide. How do I turn seven even? And the answer is you take away the S. It's the word seven, not the number seven. And now you're like, oh, so if someone goes, how do you make seven? You take away the S. You know, now I have the insight. Now I know how to get there. Now I know how to solve it. You know, it's like when somebody tells you a joke, a joke is funny the first time because you couldn't come up with a possible solution. But once you got that solution, that's what you're going to do again. Kohler did this experiment with the chimpanzees where he put some bananas up and then they finally decided to put them boxes together, go up and get the bananas. Then each successive time, it became easier. It's like the kitty cat that we talked about at the beginning of this unit, hitting on the little lever, opening up the door. He now has insight of how to go get his food. It's learning that's occurred. But a lot of times our insight can be somewhat limited to what we want to be known as confirmation bias. And confirmation bias is where we want to take something that we already know to be true, then we want evidence that's going to support that because we want our hypothesis to be true. So we're going to look for evidence that supports what I already believe. This is the reason why liberals will watch MSNBC, conservatives will watch Fox News, because that's going to give them the information that they already believe to be true. And it makes us feel better. It gives us more of a little bit of a dopamine rush. Rush. Once people have a wrong idea, they don't want to budge from their illogic because they have to admit that they were thinking illogically. They have to have that humility that they were wrong. And again, I think I've said this before, but how many times have you been in an argument and you're in an argument, you know for a fact that you are wrong, but you keep arguing because now it's about winning. Because if I admit I'm wrong, that gives them the power and I don't want to give them the power. So a lot of times we'll evade facts. We become inconsistent with our thinking, systematically defending ourselves because the new information that's irrelevant, that's bias, that's whatever. You know, I'm going to look at what I want. I'm going to make an informed decision. I love that where people go, well, I should have the right to make an informed decision. But usually our informed decision is ill-informed. <laughs> we're not, we're only taking in the information that we want that's going to support what we already believe to be true. And by the way, this is a breeding ground for stereotypes because we want to look at something that we already believe to be true. Tyler Perry movies drive me crazy. I never watched the Tyler Perry movie before about 10 years ago. I get married to my wife and her and the kids watched him. But Tyler Perry movies are basically based on every black stereotype that there is. Diary of an Angry Black Woman. It's based on every Black stereotype. So you get a lot of white people living in Nebraska, Oklahoma, Minnesota, where they don't have a lot of daily interaction. They go, well, that's how they are. Look at that. It's, it's a movie made. When we look for that, when Donald Trump gives a speech on TV, 
you got some people who go, he tells it how it is. He's a leader and he's a businessman. So I take this as good stuff. And you'll have some people go, he's a racist. How could you say that? That's just wrong. And even this, even this, you know, putting more bad things than good things, you know, that's, that's not necessarily true. We want the good. We want to get away from, we want the good stuff to support what we believe to be true. But if there's something bad, I want to put that away because that's going to get in the way of my belief. And I don't want to admit that I'm wrong. I'm wrong. I don't want to admit that I'm wrong. No, I just admit that I was wrong. And how I said that, oh, wrong. Sometimes we become fixated. And fixation is when we get locked into a way of thinking. Okay, I'll give you an example. You can take these nine dots here. You can pause this if you want, but you got the nine dots on your little, uh, your little vocabulary thing. Try to connect all nine of these dots using only four lines. You can't pick up your pencil. You can't erase. Try to connect all nine dots using only four lines. Go ahead, pause, try it. All right, and a lot of you guys are struggling. But if I gave you the hint to think outside the box, would that help you? Mike, right. here's a solution right there. You start down here, you go all the way up here, stop, go all the way over here, stop, go all the way over there, stop, go up. But for a lot of you guys, that was tough because a lot of you guys were going from here to there to there to there. Well, I missed one. Here to there to there to there. And it's hard. You didn't go outside the box. You made this a box. It's not a box. It's, it's, it's nine dots. It's not a box. But you limit yourself. And when we limit ourselves, it's very hard. Another riddle right here. A man and his two sons want to get across the river. The boat that they have available can only hold a maximum of 200 pounds. Dad weighs 200 pounds. The sons weigh 100 pounds each. We got 400 pounds of people. How do we get them all across the river? In the boat. Nobody's swimming. No one's being catapulted. We're not waiting for the, the tide to go down. How do we get all of them across in the boat? It's hard. I have one canoe. Holds 200 pounds. I got 400 pounds of people. How do I do it? Well, how about I send dad across and then, and, and well, the problem there is now I get the boat back. And then you start to think, ah, more than one trip. Send both the sons. You leave a son. Son comes back, gives it to dad. Dad goes across, gets the son back. Son goes over, picks up his brother. They come back across. I've got all four over there. You make more than one trip. But a lot of times we get locked in. I can only make one trip. No, you became fixated. We get a mental set. Try to solve a problem in the way that's always worked in the past, but it doesn't necessarily help you with the new problem. There's a story of these Korean War paratroopers. Uh, and these were guys jumping out of planes. And then they, they, there was a situation where they had run out of right-handed parachutes. So the most experienced paratrooper, they decide, hey, you're really experienced. What we're going to do is we're going to give you a left-handed one. So instead of going one, two, three, and pull over this way, you'll go one, two, three, and pull over with your left hand. Okay, great. He gets a left-handed parachute, jumps, falls to his death. Why? because they would have been better off giving the parachute, the left-handed parachute to an inexperienced paratrooper because this guy had done hundreds and hundreds of jumps, always doing this. It was hard for him to get away from that. Yet the guy who's inexperienced at it, all he knew was to pull this way. That's all he would have done. When this guy was discovered, they noticed his, his, his hand was, was uh, ripped down to the bone. His jacket was just shredded because he kept doing it. He get locked into that mental set. If I ask you to unscramble these words. The first one is bowl. The next one is camel. The next one is skunk. The next one is mouse. Starting to get a little pattern. Next one is zebra. The next one is ape. Fantastic. Unscramble these. The first one is corn. Next one is onion. Next one is tomato. Next one is pepper. Next one is beak. Next one is ape or pea. Do we go with what we already know or do we stick with this and then we get into sort of a little bit of a set? You know, we discuss this with the sensation and perception unit as well. We get a perceptual set. We have trouble taking in new information because new information is going to make it more difficult. So again, prejudice, bias, certain things act in a certain way that locks us in. A functional fix. Let's give you an example of this right here. Paperclip. What is a paperclip used for? Well, clipping paper obvious definition but could i use it for other things yeah some people go you can use it to pick a lot well, let's see you try but yeah some people could use this for picking a lot you could use it for getting the sim card 
out of your phone. You could use this. I could use this to clean up my ring if I wanted to. Could do that. I have in my life used this thing as a tie clip where I had to wear a tie and I put it behind my shirt. It's worked like that. I have used this as a flathead screwdriver. There's a lot of things that this thing could be used for besides a paper clip. So a lot of times when we get into functional fixedness, this person trying to, how do I get over to this rope? I can't do it. I suddenly take this little wrench here and use it as a weight. I get that rope coming over to me, swing it over. Take a look at this guy here with the coffee maker. I can use the water to heat up the hot dogs and then the steam coming out of it to warm up my buns. It's fascinating. You know, if I had to, how do I take a box of matches and some thumbtacks and a candle and get all of these things on a cork board? You know, tacks won't go through the candle. But what I can do is use the box. Not just there to hold the matches, I've got the box to use. Functional fixedness can sometimes get in our way. Intuition. Intuition is the way that we usually think. How many times has your coach told you, don't think about it, just do it? Because we've done things again and again and again and again. The idea is, should I trust this person? Do I shoot or pass? You're coming down the court. There's seven seconds left on the clock. You're down by one. You're not thinking, okay, I'm a 37% shooter from here. Tommy's a 28% shooter from there. There's an 85% chance I get the pass over there. No, you just either shoot or you pass. It's, 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 it's a gut thing. Most decisions we make are on the fly. It's by the seat of our pants. When I'm making a left, I'm making a left-handed turn. I'm not thinking, okay, I need to take my hands and go to a 42-degree angle. I need to put my foot down 38 degrees. And there's 26% chance of rain, so there's some precipitation. on the No, I just do it. I just do it. We don't analyze every situation. We don't run through every scenario. We do that. We become paralyzed. So, again, we're not born with a lot of instinct. But over time, we learn intuition. We learn intuition, but that intuition can also be blinded by logic as well. Okay. Now we talked about heuristics. Let's get into what's called a representative heuristic. So again, a heuristic is a shortcut in the way that we judge. So a representative heuristic is basically this idea of us trying to take a shortcut and thinking that the world's going to even out. But if I flip a coin and it lands on heads 10 times in a row, which one is it going to land on next time? It's a 50 50 shot. It could be heads, it could be tails. But a lot of us think, no, tails is due. Tails is not due. Again, think of how many times we've talked about this before with memory that you've been taking a test. You hit like 10 trues in a row and you're like, false is due. No, it's not. I have made tests where I have looked at the key and there were like five B's in a row. And as I'm making the key, I'm like, oh, they're screwed on this test. I'm not going to remake it now, you know, but that's going to throw some people off. And as a matter of fact, if I told you, on the next test, and I think I talked about this with memory, that there were going to be 10 A's and 10 B's and 10 C's and 10 D's and 10 E's that screw with your memory. The world doesn't have to even out. And they do this. If you ever play roulette, which you shouldn't because gambling is wrong and immoral, but you know, you, you can bet on any of these, but they'll put this little thing up here. Here are the last 10 spins. It doesn't matter. It just hit 26 or 23 red. What are the odds of it hitting 23 red on the next one? I don't know, one in 38. You get the two greens there. And this is that gambler's fallacy, mistakenly believe that since something is happening more often, it will happen less often in the future. The world doesn't have to even out. Time is infinite. You know, not everything has to hit our ideas of fairness and what it should be. We take a look at this person right here. We take a look at this person right here. Swimsuit model, Mark Zuckerberg, who do you think graduated from Harvard? Swimsuit model. She graduated from Harvard. Mark Zuckerberg never graduated. He's done all right for himself, never graduated. So again, when things don't, don't work out the way, it, it feels a little bit weird. And then we have what is called the availability heuristic. And the availability heuristic is when we rely on information that's kind of the loudest to us. You know, we talked about this before when you change the answers on your test. You remember more often the answers that you change it from the right to the wrong because that hurt, that was painful. That was painful when I changed that answer and I got the wrong answer. You ignore all the times you change it from the wrong to the right because you, you, you just, you got it right. Well, I just read it wrong, whatever. You know, uh, when you when your parents ask you, hey, could you empty the dishwasher? I always have to empty the dishwasher. They haven't asked you in two weeks. But now you're remembering every time you've been asked. You don't have to do this all the time. No, you don't. You really don't. But since you don't like doing it, those times seem more recent than what they really were. If I were to ask you, if we took a random paragraph out of a random book, is the letter K more likely to be the first or third letter of any word in that random paragraph? 
And most of us would think it's the first letter because we think of, you know, there's, there's a dictionary, there's an entire section of words that begin with K, you know, knock, kingdom, night. There's a bunch of them, K-N-I-G-H-C. There's a bunch of them that start with K, but we don't think of the third letter. But if you think of the third letter, and then and, and, and suddenly I go, you know, like the word like, and I go, well, what rhymes with like? Like, bike, hike, tyke. There's a lot of words at the third letter's K. As a matter of fact, those are more commonly used words. And you're two to three times more likely for a random paragraph to have a word have the third letter K than the first letter K. But we don't think about that. We have this sense of control that we really shouldn't. We rely on information that's more easily recalled. It's why people play the lottery because they remember all the stories of the winner. Well, what they do? They pick seven numbers. I can pick seven numbers. So we overestimate the chances that we'll win. People will play mega millions, one in 176 million. Powerball, one in 195 million. Texas lottery, one in 25 million. They're all terrible odds, but we think of this person who got the big check. We don't think of the idiot at Circle K who's sitting there going, I want three of those, I want four of those, when's your birthday, give me the scratch off, give me the scratch And then when they win, they just turn it in for more scratch off tickets and they walk out a loser. Casino celebrity victories, lights, loud noises. So you just assume everyone's winning. There's noises all over the place. Yeah, but you, it's the noise of that guy winning over there, not the 20 losers between you and him. So this is this I must be do representative heuristic along with the availability of heuristic of remembering when everybody else got it. You have this perceived control. Really interesting study where they took, they gave a lottery ticket. People are either handed a lottery ticket or they were said, pull a lottery ticket out of that pile. Okay. And those who chose their ticket when selling it, if you chose your ticket out of a pile versus had one handed to you, if you chose it, you ask for a higher price in order to sell it because you think it's more special. Why? Because you chose it. When asked to bet on a card drawn from a deck versus someone else, people bet less when the person who drew it from the deck was well-dressed. They bet more when the person seemed disheveled. It's the same randomness of drawing a card. But we look at that person, oh, they're well-dressed. They probably picked a better card. Oh, they're just shoveled. They probably picked a worse card. It has nothing to do. It's a randomness thing. But we try to make sense of random things in life. Uh, other things with availability heuristic, the media uses this. And media is going to use stories that it's going to get you to tune in, not necessarily what's representative of the world. Everybody thinks a teenage, is so, teenage crime is so high because when teenagers screw up, it's on the news everywhere, everywhere. You know, no one's doing a news story. No one's making a YouTube video. You know, Tommy at home, here I am studying for my AP test. No one's making that video. You know, they're making videos of them jumping off the roof into a pool after they've hit a trampoline or whatever. So we think every kid's doing that. No, they're not. It's the few idiots that are putting it on TV and we all see the story. So we all think it's happening with everyone. Think about all the reports about what went wrong versus what went right. If you've got a choice between two stories, one story is guy comes home, sees his wife in bed with another man, shoots him, shoots her, takes his car. And now he's leading a police chase up, up the Sam Houston toll road. You're going to turn into that. It's on 13 ABC. On channel 11, a fireman is saving a kitty from a tree. Huh. I want to see a car chase because <laughs> I want to feel better about my life. But also there's the fact he's coming up to Sam Houston toll road. He, he can come right up to 90. I might be on TV. Okay, it's why so many people get upset about school shootings in the suburbs, but when it happens in the inner city, it's like, ah, well, you know, that's what happens. And they tend to be single shootings as opposed to mass shootings, shark weeks. You're 66 times more likely to be killed by bees or wasps, three times more likely to be killed in an elementary school playground. We don't have monkey bar week, shark week to reaffirm the bias we already have against sharks. Fear of flying, you are 26 times more likely to die in a car crash than on a plane. These planes are flown by professionals. As a matter of fact, most plane crashes are recreational pilots. You know, the people who aren't doing it for a living and have somebody check up a roller coaster versus an America round. You are ah, five times, I think it's five times more likely to go to the hospital riding America round than riding a roller coaster. Roller coasters are safe. Roller coasters are checked all the time. Roller coasters ch -ch 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 -ch, strapped in. You can't move. You get on a merry-go-round, I'm going to ride the line and the zebra. The ch -ch -ch -ch, you're in the ambulance. But we don't think about that because we think we could control that. Politicians get elected by telling you what's wrong. 
fear of attack, fear of a terrorist, fear of whatever. You know, ISIS, just a few years ago, back in 2015, ISIS was the biggest threat. There was a Christmas party in December 2015. 14 people were killed in the California terrorist attack. Probably the last real terrorist attack uh, from an outside group, not, not an inside group. I'm not talking about, you know, what happened at the Pulse nightclub in Florida or what happened in Washington, D.C. on the 6th. I'm talking about outside forces coming here. 14 people were killed and suddenly ISIS becomes one of the stories of the 2016 election. 30 people died every day in 2015 from gun violence from other Americans. You know, this, this one day didn't even make up half of what was gonna happen in that day on average anyways, but we don't ban guns. 60 people die every day in 2015 from suicide, but we don't stop people from being around themselves. 30 people died every day in 2015 from auto accidents, but we don't make automobiles illegal. Three people died every day in 2015 from domestic violence, but marriage is still legal. We think this stuff we can control. Oh, it's my gun. Oh, I'm not gonna commit suicide. Oh, I drive a car well. Oh, my marriage is happy. And we think we're special in that. But this, ISIS, oh, I can't control that. There's 17,000 homicides every year. There's 31,000 suicides. We are twice as dangerous to ourselves than anybody else is towards us. Plus we're around ourselves every day. Heart disease kills four times as many people as accidents, homicides, and suicides combined. Yet McDonald's is still allowed to serve food, <laughs> you know? So we get wrapped up into specific little things and it sort of drives us a little bit crazy. And I know as I say this, there's some of you out there right now that are going, well, because COVID, why should we get to, what are the odds on you? Okay, let's take a look at COVID. Is the media being responsible or is it going for ratings? And the answer is actually both. But unlike the possibility of a terrorist attack, COVID was more widely spread in the United States and other places. Even if not directly impacted with the illness, it still impacts livelihood and people around you and everything else. But we gotta be careful with how it's being reported. Is it the total number of cases or is it the total current cases? You know, when I'm looking at right now, it's August of 2021 that I'm doing this, how relevant are the numbers of August of 2020? Are we talking about the number of people that are tested? We're talking about the positivity rate. You know, take a look at these two charts right here. You know, this chart and this chart are two totally different charts. As a matter of fact, this chart falls in right here. This is really high, this is really low because the blue is a percentage of positive tests. This is the percentage of positive tests versus the total daily tests taken and the total positive tests. Well, that's really small. This looks pretty high because it's the percentage, but here it's kind of small compared to everything else. So you gotta sort of look at that, you know, but then we come over here and we take a look at, these are the total number of new cases with a rolling seven day average. And again, we're in August of 2020. August of 2020, we're up to here. I'm getting ready to start school in a couple of weeks. This is way higher than it was, I'm sorry, in 2021. This is way higher than it was in August of 2020. But now we got a vaccination and everything else. So how do we sort of judge that? And it really becomes difficult. And again, people will go, well, why don't we cover the good news? Why don't we co cover the people that survive? What about all the people who don't get COVID? Well, if you only cover the good news, then we get into this false sense of, of security. You know, uh, when there were mask mandates, I would see people who wouldn't wear a mask when there was a mask mandate and they'd go into a store and buy a lottery ticket, which didn't make a lot of sense when you're thinking logically, you know, you're, you're, why aren't you wearing a mask? Well, what are the odds that COVID's going to happen to me? Well, why are you playing the lottery? Well, someone's got to win. You know, it's, it's a really sort of confusing thing. Now, again, let's take a look at some statistics, and we're going to go back to December 2020. There are 13.8 million total cases, which is 4% of the population, 271,000 deaths, 1.97% of the 13.8 million cases. So that was your death rate of the percentage of people that got it, but the death rate of the United States, only one-tenth of 1% 1 of the U.S. population had died, but it was still the third leading cause of death in the U.S. Then as we're going into school now, and by the time you get this, it's gonna be October, November, but in August, there were 36 million total cases. Now we're up to 10.9% of the population. Well, that's, but these cases have nothing to do with those cases. There's 617,000 deaths, which is 1.71% of all cases. So the death rate has gone down a little bit, but it hasn't gone down significantly. And now we're talking about one fifth of 1% of the US population has died, currently the sixth leading cause of death as of August of 2021. 
So you could look at the good news of it. It's still only one fifth of one percent of the U.S. population, or it's one point seven one percent of the cases, which is a much higher. It's, and again, depending on what the agenda of the news is, it's going to be how they report it. What's the agenda of the politician is going to impact how they report it. So a lot of times you got to look for the answer to be somewhere in the middle there, somewhere in the middle. Okay. So again, a lot of the reasons, the things that get in the way of our problem solving is a rigid, a rigidity, you know, insight is when we solve a riddle, you know, once we solve a riddle, then it becomes pretty easy. And if you go back and look at this PowerPoint, the PowerPoint is filled with a bunch of riddles. I'm not going to go through them. Look at the PowerPoint and that will show you how thinking sort of happens there. Okay. That should wrap us up.